of the earth now rejoice. All the nations of the earth now rejoice. All the people of God sing His praise. All the people of God sing His praise. Everything that has breath shout for joy. Everything that has breath shout for joy. Everything that is beautiful belongs to you. Oh, the earth is the Lord. Everything is yours. Sing his praise. Everything that has breath shall put joy. Everything that is beautiful. And now the earth is the Lord. Everything is yours. You are. And oh, the earth is the Lord. Everything is that you had a, uh, a very tremendous Father's Day to all the fathers. Uh, I just want to thank all of you that blessed me on Father's Day, the calls that came in, the texts, emails, as well as those of you that sent uh, just greetings. I so appreciate uh, the role that I play in your lives. And uh, I just want to commend all fathers on uh, as we spent uh, Sunday together. My family took me out to dinner, so we uh, enjoyed a real nice dinner together. So we just look forward to uh, even the other uh, times together. Now we're getting ready for the 4th of July and had a new holiday uh, that was uh, celebrated this year for the first time, and that's Juneteenth. 
So we so appreciate uh, what has happened, even as we look at the end of slavery, the end of slavery, not just uh, the first uh, month, the first day of the first year when slavery really ended, but when it was made known that slavery had come to an end. So tonight we're going to uh, also, I want to also remind you to uh, be a part of our foundation classes every Saturday at 11 o'clock a.m. to 12, 15 p.m. Every Saturday we uh, get together on Zoom uh, to go through uh, foundational classes, catechism. I was just listening the other day where uh, uh, there were some others that are coming out with books on catechism. But I believe what God is wanting to do is make sure that all of those of us who st study the word of the Lord have a sure foundation established within our lives. So now let's take time. Let's go into the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all that you're making known to us. And we pray even in these messages as we continue to speak on fatherhood and the relationship between the father and the son, which is a part of uh, is a vital part of our foundation that we will come to understand, realize the significance uh, of the message that's being taught here tonight. So bless now, may you speak through me into the hearts and lives of those that will receive. We give you the honor, praise and glory in Jesus name, amen. But to talk about knowing father through the son, uh, we talk about foundational classes, but I believe what God is giving me is very foundational as well. And it's something how the teachings on Saturdays dovetail into the teachings that take place on Wednesdays and even on Sundays. But knowing the Father through the Son, knowing Jesus as Lord, that you may know God as Father. Did you hear what I say? In knowing Jesus Christ as Lord, that you may know God as Father. It is, uh, what we're talking about is that to know Jesus as Lord, it is Jesus Christ who brings us to the place where we're made to recognize, uh, made to recognize all he is revealed, the Father is revealed through the Son. We talk about uh, recognition and revelation it is to bring out into the open that which otherwise would be concealed. And in this, we talk about the Father and the Son. We talk about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. His Lordship is radi radically connected to the fatherhood of God. When we speak of his Lordship, his Lordship is radically connected to the fatherhood of God. And this is something I'm going to talk about tonight so that you can come to a place of understanding it all the more. It is through his lordship that he reveals to us the Father. And there are many scriptures to support that, which we'll go into some of them tonight. But understand we talk about the Father. Let's look at Father for a moment. We talk about lordship, the Father. We talk about the origin of all creation and how uh, he brings us into right relationship and harmony with nature and all living things. Every living creature, we come into harmony with all that God has made as a result of recognizing, first of all, the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who reveals to us the fatherhood of God. Now, we're going to start with this scripture here, Malachi chapter 2. Verse 10, to kind of dovetail into Sunday's message. Here's what uh, God said through the prophet. Have we, not, have we not all one father? This was a rhetorical question. He says, have we not all one father? And, and, and then to further uh, highlight that, we talk about the fatherhood of God. He says, has not one God created us. Now listen to both of these. Have we not all, every one of us, one father? Not always is he recognized, but the truth of the matter is that we all have one father. Now it says another area that may not be recognized 
is that has not one God created us. We did not make ourselves. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We talk about the making of man. We talk about man's origin, the creation of mankind, Adam being made. But then we talk about the further making of man, the forming of man, the forming of the person that we became or we ought to become. Have we not one God who created us? Why? And then it asked the question, these questions, rhetorical questions, if these are in fact the truth, if these are in fact the truth, this is what he's really saying. If you agree upon these two statements, then why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? Now he gets into a, a, a situation we talk about behavior now. We talk about activities that take place among humankind. And he asked the question, if we have one father and if one God created all of us, then the question is based upon behavior, why do we deal treacherously with one another? How? By profaning the covenant of the fathers. Now, when it talks about profaning the covenant of the fathers, it is saying that the covenant that had been established by the fathers with God, the covenant that had been established between God and I would say the children of Israel, but we see them, we see the fathers, the fathers of faith, the fathers that preceded us. He says, why do you profane the covenant of the fathers? And in profaning the covenant of the fathers, the covenant that was established between the fathers and God, and that covenant that was to be kept by faith and in faith. He says that when it is profaned, it is really in essence, you are, uh, you are denying that you have one father and you're also denying the fact that it was one God that created us. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a correlation between the father and the fathers or the elders. That's what he's really saying. We begin to see how God spoke at one time. He will speak by the prophets to, he will speak to the prophets who will speak to the fathers, who will speak to the tribes. But he says in these last days, he's spoken through his son. But now we see a correlation between the, the father, we talk about God as father, and the fathers are the elders. You see the elders, we said them, we talk about the elders, the aged ones, the mature ones. We talk about maturity, those, the experienced ones, those that have gone through experience with the father. Now we see that in first John, what has happened? People who have grown in, in, in the faith, those who have foundation established within their lives. He says, what has happened? There would be a generation that would come after them that would profane the covenant of the fathers because the responsibility of the generations that were to come was to maintain the covenant that had already been established. That was the uh, objective. And the same thing, you see, there are some traditions that, that, that ought not be violated. There are many traditions that ought not be valid. And I know in our day and time, people want to get rid of or dispense of everything that's old and everything that appears to be traditional. But there are some traditions that are to be maintained. We talk about the traditions of the elders, the traditions of the fathers, which was really uh, uh, birthed out of a covenant, out of the covenant that was established between God and uh, the, his, his, the elders or the fathers. So, so in that, it is ours to make sure that we maintain. We must not uh, uh, violate those things that have been established by God among us. And, and in this day, that's very key. That's very important because we see in our day where covenants are being broken. The, the, the compromise is, is at an all time high where people do not respect uh, uh, the word of God as it ought to be respected. It is, it, it is more arbitrary today than it ought to be. People make it say what they want it to say rather than the word saying what the word is in fact saying. So in this, 
let's go back to understand the elders now, the elders of the two ones. The, the, we talk about his objective is to bring many sons to glory. It is that all of us grow in grace, knowledge of uh, the son of God, that we, as we grow older, we don't just grow older or we just age, but we mature. Now in this, in 1 Corinthians chapter, 1 Timothy rather, chapter five, verse one, it says, rebuke not an elder. It says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren. Now listen to what he's saying. This is the King James. It is says, rebuke not an elder. Do not rebuke. It is saying to speak harshly or to speak condescending. And uh, but, but understand there has to be a reverence and respect for elders. There has to be respect. We mentioned uh, early on about the loss of shame, but then we also see the loss of respect for elders. In our day, we had to have titles or names. Uh, we call uh, Mr. Mrs. We had to call them uh, uncle or something that would, we just don't call them by their first name, but there was a respect uh, that, that was shown by uh, younger, uh, by children. And, and understand not only children, but even adults would respect older adults by making sure that they do not look at them as being the same as they are, but they respect their age, they respected their maturity, they respected their wisdom. All of those things are things that in our day are lost. Now, everybody's first name, everybody is, uh, I mean, we've gotten to the place where I call it casual Christianity. It's relaxed and casual and there's no more reverence. And, 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 and I would say when you lose your reverence, you, use, you lose your fear of God because you, you get to the place where you let down and, and, and you begin to lose your fear of the Lord. But understand what happens when we speak of this. Uh, we talk about God being the creator and, and we talk about the covenants and established even uh, with the fathers by God. What happens when we begin to lose that reverence People lose purpose. People lose purpose. People get to the place where there's no purpose in life any longer. Why am I here? What do I suppose to be doing? And how do I suppose to do it? When people lose purpose, uh, because you see, when God is not God, when God is not sovereign any longer, when Jesus is no longer lording over us, look at respect now. We're seeing Jesus as Lord. What is respect? We don't just call him we don't just loosely and very glibly say, oh, oh Jesus is my partner or, or whatever, but we have respect. He is the master, uh, uh, Lord Jesus Christ. You, you see that? The Lord Jesus Christ. There's a respect that, that, that's given to him. So, so now, when, and, and then it, the same thing applies as, as it goes down to others. We begin to look at a person. He said, father this or daddy or, or, or something that would show uh, respect for, for elders. But when you lose uh, respect, you lose purpose. And when you lose purpose, you lose hope. You, you see, you think that it's just a matter of putting everybody on the same level, but it also brings a place where you lose purpose. When you lose purpose, you lose hope. And understand that is happening in our generation where people have lost purpose and many people have lost hope. And we wonder, we say, well, look at what's happening to the young people, look at the directions they're taking. But you realize that it didn't just happen, but there were contributing factors to the behavior that we see uh, demonstrated in our day and our time. So now uh, I'm gonna go back to scripture so that we can begin to uh, look at how to put the pieces back together again. You see, when things begin to fall apart, when society it, it begins to fall apart, we begin to see it dismantling or the seams uh, uh, begin to uh, fall apart. What do we do? We go to the scriptures so we see how God's intent is for man to put things back together. Here in Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, he says, look what he says here. Look what he says here. I believe in light of what I shared, he says, for by grace, you have been saved. Now let's stop there for a moment. By grace, you have been saved. Now I'm headed to understand something of lordship because we got to go back and restore Jesus Christ as Lord so that he can reveal to us the Father, the Father. So it says, by grace you have been saved. Saved from what? 
saved from destruction, saved from destruction. Uh, 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 what what if we talk about destruction? What the adversary does against us. We talk about destruction. The enemy, the what the thief comes, but to kill, steal, and to destroy. So we see the adversary, the objective of the adversary is to tear things apart. He is to take away from us, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's the adversary's objective. He works against us. So we talk about being saved. We are saved from the works of the devil. But then it is not just the works of the devil. We are saved from the works of the flesh. We're saved from the works of the flesh. He says, because it says, for by grace you have been saved from what? You're saved from that which causes us to perish or waste away. And we have to see it this way too. By grace you have been saved. You're saved from that which, you're saved from perishing or wasting away. Wasting your time, wasting your talents, wasting your treasures, wasting your energy, wasting away. You, you see, because when one we call cancer, you, you see, that's it, 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 it has a way of causing one to waste away. So we are saved from wasting away. So, so look at what he says here. What, and we talk about waste away. That's what man does to himself. Now we see what the enemy does. The enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy. But the works of the flesh is what man does against himself. Why? Because he has no purpose, therefore he has no hope. So as a result of it, we begin to see, by grace we have been saved from perishing or wasting away. We've been saved from also uh, the destruction of the enemy. Now, it is a gift of God. It is a gift of God. Now listen to what we're saying here, that God has gifted us so that we do not allow the enemy to destroy us or we do not destroy ourselves because God has given us a gift. Now what is his gift? He has given us a gift so that, what is it? The gift of grace so that we are postured to make sense of life and to see beyond what those who are blind are incapable of seeing. We can see what they are incapable of seeing. So now it says here that uh, uh, it is a gift of God to see beyond yourself. It is to see beyond what is happening, see beyond the horizon, but also to see beyond yourself so that you're not self-contained, so that your focus is not merely upon yourself. Because uh, as many would say, if a person, a, a, a person that's wrapped up in himself makes a very small package. So now it, it, you see beyond yourself. Now he says, it is not of works. It is not of works. This talk about works, it, it is not of self-preservation. It is not man trying to preserve himself. It is not you're trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It is saying that there's no way for you to, 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 to cause things to happen the way they ought to happen. But it is by grace you have been rescued from self-preservation or having self-assurance uh, or your security being in and of yourself. He said, lest anyone should boast or be prideful in, in, in your own accomplishments apart from God. Because we talk about his lordship. Now this person uh, uh, is boasting on what he or she is able to do. And therefore, you're denying the lordship of Jesus Christ. You're denying the fatherhood of God, who is the origin of all things, because that person becomes a self-made, in his own eyes, a self-made man or woman. He says, so now, uh, this is the thing that happens when Christ is taken out of the picture, who reveals to us the Father, God, who is the creator of all things. He says, for we are his workmanship. Uh, one translation says we are his handiwork. We are his masterpiece. It helps us to understand the, the creative genius of God, how God was fully involved in the making of man. And his objective 
was to see the reflection of himself in us. He wanted to see the reflection of his son now in us and through us. We're created, but, but that's what he talks about in God, but now in Christ Jesus for good works, for good works, so that we can participate with God in what he is determined to do within the earth realm. You understand, it's not just what he desires, it is his desire, but his desire is his determination because God, whatever he desires, he will ultimately accomplish. But the issue is, will we be a part of what God is doing? So it is for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk. He didn't say that we will walk, but we should walk in them. So this is the opportunity that he affords us, that we can be a part of something that's greater than ourselves. So, so understand, it's by grace, by grace, God's grace, God's uh, provision, his provision extended towards us that we might become participants in that which God is in fact doing. But now we talk about purpose, which leads to hope. Purpose, which leads to hope. We have a purpose for life. What is that? To participate with God in what he's doing, to be a part of what God, he is our God. He created all things. He has a purpose for us. We have, we're part of God's plan and all that he desired to do within the earth realm. So now this is where God has us. This is God's objective intent for each and every one of our lives. So now, if that be the case, now we go back to scripture again in Jeremiah chapter nine, verse 23, a scripture that I've used many times, but, but within the context of what I'm sharing here tonight, Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 9, 23. He said, thus say the Lord, who's talking now? The Lord, the Lord. What is that? The Lord, the sovereign one. Thus says the Lord that now if God's talking, he is the Lord. It is saying that we are subject to him, that we are, he is a superior one and we are inferior to him. He says, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. He didn't say he didn't have wisdom but do not let the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not him glory in his wisdom. In other words, don't let him boast. Let me, let me read it first in the King James, and I'm going to, I mean the New King James, then I'm gonna read it in the message paraphrase because it really, I would say it, it, it amplifies uh, the scripture. It says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Now the message puts it this way. God's message, this is what it says, God's message. Don't let the wise brag of their wisdom. Now listen to what he's saying. Don't let the wise, it didn't say he wasn't wise, but he becomes prideful and begin to brag on how much he think he knows. Because you understand, Lord always know more than you know. And wisdom comes from God. Don't let the heroes brag of their exploits. Whatever your exploits might have been, the temptation would be to brag. When you brag, what are you saying? You're denying the Lordship of Jesus Christ because then you begin to see yourself as the origin of all things rather than a participant in that which God is doing. He don't let the heroes brag of their exploits. Uh, don't let the rich brag of their riches. Don't begin to be boastful and braggadocious about your riches. Whatever money, whatever you might have managed, keep your mouth shut. Don't be bragging about how much you have and all the things that you possess. He says, if you brag, he didn't say stop bragging, but he'll tell you what to brag about. He didn't tell you stop bragging, but I'm gonna tell you what to brag about. I'm gonna tell you to boast about what, what you could take pride in. He said, if you wanna brag, brag of this and this only. What? That you understand and know me. Now, now the, he says understand and know, but if you go to the King James, he said understand depth and know it which helps you to understand it's a continuation. He says, what I understand, there's still room to understand more. What I know, there's still room to know more. He says, so it is a continuum. 
that I continue to understand and I continue to know. Uh, I continue to know the Lord. That's the objective. He says, the objective is to grow in grace, knowledge of the Lord, that each day I, I'm discovering something of God that I did not know before. He says, and I'm understanding. When I don't understand, I don't dismiss it because I don't understand it. Because oftentimes what we don't understand, we dismiss. We say it must not be true because I don't know it. That's the bragger, that's a braggadocious individual because he feels that if he doesn't have it or doesn't understand it, it couldn't be true. He said, but don't brag. And if, if you brag, brag in this, you understand, know me. He says, he says, and here's the thing he says, he says, I'm God, I'm God, I am the Lord, and I act in loyal love. I like the way he put that. I, I act in loyal love. He says, I am the Lord, I am the Lord. You have to understand, he, he begins to establish himself, his lordship, that I am the Lord. And he says, and, and then as a king, new King James says, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. But he says, I act in loyal love. I do what's right, and I set things right and fair, and delight in those who do the same things. These are my trademarks. God's decree. So he says, so when he says exercising loving kindness, judgments and righteousness, he is saying that I, I, I'm i always displaying these attributes at all times. I'm, I'm putting those things on display even when you don't understand them. He said, because your understanding has to develop to a level of, of comprehending what God is in fact doing at a particular time, at a given time. He's exercising loving kindness, but also judgment and righteousness. Where? In the earth. For in these things I delight. Or as, as uh, in, in the uh, message, these are my trademarks. So God is, is saying, he said, this is who I am. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. But now you understand me through the things that I share about myself. I'm making myself known through the things that I express. So now, now we look at the Father, we look at the Father speaking, but now we have to look at the Father through the Son. In these last days, he has spoken through his Son. He has spoken by the prophets to the fathers, to the children. And, and but now he has spoken these last days to the Son. So now what do we do? We see the Father through the Son. See, when you see me, you have seen the Father. So we see the Father through the Son. It is, in other words, when you when we see Christ contained within him is all is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So 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 Jesus introduced that in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, where he says, at that time. Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father. He's speaking to his Father. I thank you, Father. And then when he says, Father, he began to explain who he is. You're Lord of both heaven and earth. He began to show his domain. His, the sphere of his rule is both in heaven, which is perfect perfection. That's how one theologian puts it. There are no, there's no error. There's no confusion in heaven. He says, but you're also Lord of the earth where confusion reigns. He said, but even though the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one, you're still Lord over the earth. You made the earth and ultimately the, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth even as the water covered the sea. So, so God does not give up anything because of that interval that takes place within time where others may be in charge and control, but he ultimately, he is still sovereign and he will ultimately put on display his sovereignty. So now we begin to see his Lord of heaven and earth. He said, but what you've done, you have hidden these things from those, we talk about the wisdom, don't brag in your wisdom, but you've hidden those things from those who are wise and prudent. You've hidden these things. In other words, those that are boasting in their wisdom, those that are boasting in their riches, those that are uh, and the exploits and, 
the like. He said, what you do, they do it at a cost. That, that, that is a, they're penalized. What did they, what are they, how are they penalized? They're penalized from not knowing that which God knows or would reveal otherwise. Because understand what God would do. It is the wisdom of God that, that is lacking in their experience. He says, so now, he, and, and, and God hides it. God, he hides that wisdom from the wise and prudent, because if not, they'll have more reason to brag. They have more reason to boast. They have more things to boast in, because then they will begin to say that they are just like God and that they have reached that place of utopia, that utopian dream has been realized. But here's what he said. He said, he said you've hidden those things from the wise and the prudent. You've hidden them from them, but you, here, 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 here's, I would say this is the majesty of it all. When you reveal them, under babes, but you have revealed them under babes. So that which the wisest individual and the most prudent individual would not know, a person that's a babe in Christ would have knowledge of. Might not be as articulate, might not be as polished and, 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 and impressive, but there's a wisdom that will come forth that the wise and the prudent could never uh, resource. So, so that's what you be very careful how we judge a thing. I would say there are many that are, that they, they look at those things that are impressionable. They look at those things that, 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 that I would say that appear to be knowledge or appear to be wisdom and they miss out on the true wisdom of God. So, so in other words, don't try to be heavy. Don't try to be so heavy in, in, in your, uh, articulation, but be at a place where you're, you're, you're still teachable and, and pliable in the hands of God to, to receive simple truths because oftentimes in those simple truths are the profound, is the profound wisdom of God. Profound wisdom. God will speak on, Jesus will speak on simple things, but he will speak in simplicity, but he will speak, but you will see the, how the profundity of those simple things that he's speaking on. So now we begin to look at, he's hidden them from the wise and prudent but he makes it known to his little ones. Even a child could operate in simple faith and, and resource or access uh, uh, heaven and receive the blessings that will come down from heaven while a person with all the degrees, more degrees than, than a thermometer, couldn't even uh, get a prayer past the ceiling. So now he says, even so, Father, for, it's, for it seemed good in your sight. It seemed good in your sight. God, God says, I did it. I, that's how you wanted to, things to be managed so that through humility, those who are humble can receive, but those that are boastful and proud, uh, you reject, you see. You, you reject the, those who are, 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 are proud and braggadocious, but you dwell among the humble. He says, and then he, Jesus says, all things. Now, now, again, you know, people say, how much is all? All things have been delivered to me by my Father. All things. That's inclusive of everything. Everything has been given to me by my Father. There's nothing outside of, 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 of anything. There's not outside of that. Everything has been delivered to me. And look at the word, delivered to me. God has placed it into my hands. The Father has placed it all in my hands. Now we look at the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. You understand in creation, he was, uh, he was uh, involved in the creation of all things because we see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in work in creation. But now we see the Son in charge of all things. All things have been delivered unto me as, as the Son of God, in this earthly ministry that I'm engaged in, it's been delivered to me uh, by my father. He says, so now contained within this simple uh, 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 fisherman or, or this uh, carpenter from Galilee, uh, contained within one that was born in the manger, wrapped in rags, swaddling clothes, rag, it, it, all things have been delivered unto me. He said, but the problem is, if you look at the exterior, you won't know it. 
but no one knows the son except the father. Because as he said, he has hidden them from the wise and prudent. He also hides, he will hide those that belong to him. No one knows the son except the father. In other words, what God knows about those that he has assigned and appointed, those who would observe would not know it. Why? Because they're blinded by their own wisdom and their own prudence. They cannot see or tap into the resources that are right before them. Why? Because God won't even let them see it. In other words, Christ can walk right in their midst and they'll miss him. Why? Because they're too smart to see him as he is. Isn't that something? They're too smart to recognize him as he is. They know too much about what they think they know to really know him. He says, so he, uh, he says, so no one knows the son except the father. No one knows Christ. Well, I know him. I know him. Yeah, wait a minute. Do you really know him? You might have read about him. You might have studied his origin. You might have studied history and, and you know Greek and Hebrew, but do you really know him? He said, no one knows him except the father. And, and understand this word knowing, epikonosis, it is saying having full knowledge of the son. We mentioned he, uh, their full knowledge of the son, that everything there is to know about the father is known by the son. All the intricate details of the father is known by the son. He says, so now no one knows the son except the, 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 the father, but the father has full knowledge. Uh, the son has full knowledge of the father. Then he says, so no one does anyone, nor does anyone know the father except the son. You, you, you see, except the son. So we begin to see where the son knows all things about the, the father knows all things about the son, everything about Christ that is to be known, the father has full knowledge of him. But then it says, no one knows the father except the son. But, but then it goes on to say, and the one whom the son wills to reveal him. But you have to meet the criteria. In order for the son to reveal the father, there are certain criteria that must be met. We mentioned humility. You, you, not the wise and prudent, because he will not reveal the Father to you if you're wise in your own eyes. You, you, you'll get to the place where you will rely and be dependent upon what you think you know of him. And God, over time, will have to prove that all that you think you know is false. He says, so he has to. It is only those who meet the criteria. And he dwells in the high and holy place with those who who are of a contrite spirit, contrite heart, contrite spirit, broken heart, contrite spirit. They text that humility in order for him to reveal the Father to you. He says, I'll show you Father, but you have to be at a place where you can, uh, where I can show you the Father. You can't be so much into yourself. So, so, so a lot of our work as pastors is to dismantle uh, the confidence that people have in themselves or are, 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 are looking to, um, to themselves and wanting to do things for themselves, but get to the place where you say, it's all unto you, Father. Lordship now. You see, it's a lordship of Jesus Christ. I would say it is it, is the hardest uh, thing to convince people of. And we understand the convincing must take place by way of the Spirit, uh, because uh, the Lord desire for us to, see, when we surrender all, this whole thing of surrender all to his lordship, that Lord, you're, 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 you're Lord over all. I, I surrender everything to you. It's not about me, it's all about you. See, that's what we talk about. So now, when he, he you see, so so I, I would put it this way. The, the Jesus want to reveal the Father to you, but the only way you can receive it is that you must humble yourselves. You must humble yourselves. You must come to the end of yourself. It's too much flesh in individuals to really know the Father, to know, first of all, to come into the Lordship of Jesus so that Jesus can reveal the Father. You, you can't separate the Father from the Son. You can't separate the Father from the Son. It is accepting the Lordship of Jesus Christ so that Christ can introduce you to the Father. And he wants to show you the Father as he is, not based upon your perception of the Father. 
because you probably had a perception already uh, of who the father is. He's mean, he's harsh, he's cruel. He's a God who's insensitive and all that kind of stuff because you begin to read in history, all the things, destructive measures that were taken against the enemies of Christ. We begin to see his judgments that didn't make sense to us because our wisdom stood in the way of us understanding how God would judge a thing. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira and all the other stuff. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to us. But understand, in humility, we say, Lord, teach me what I do not see. Teach me the humility that must take place within our hearts. Is that, Lord, I don't see it. I don't understand it. But I'm not going to ever judge it as being wrong. But I would always look at it from this point of view. It is something I don't understand. But you understand it. But I ask you, over time, when you see me reach that point where there's nothing in me standing in the way of receiving that revelation, Reveal to me where you are in relation to these particular things. He says, so now the rest of scripture helps us understand this. He says, uh, now he wills, it is his will to reveal the father to us. It is his desire, it is his passion to make the father known to us. It is not his to, to, to withhold that, but we mentioned the criteria must be met in order for us to see the father as he is. So, so, so he says, so here's how we get there. Come to me. That's the invitation. Come unto me. Come to me. Jesus invites us to himself. And when he says, come to me, he says, he says, receive me. Come to me. Become one that walk with me. Be one that will be my disciple. That's walking with Christ. He says, come to me. Uh, engage in the activity that I'm engaged in. Walk with me. Allow your life to become one with my life. Except you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have no part in me. Let your life become one with my life. Become one with me. When you come to him, it's not saying you visit him and you, you, you engage for a few minutes with him. But you're saying, Lord, now I have become a disciple. In other words, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. Wherever you go. Now, you may lead me some places that I wouldn't otherwise go, but I've already committed. When I say yes to you, I'm willing and ready to go wherever you lead me, even if it's through the valley of the shadow of death. So now, and I have confidence, that, uh, so therefore I not fear no evil. So now he says, he says, come to me. He says, all you who are self-confident, you who are laboring in your own strength, and as a result of it, you're heavy laden. That's the result of laboring in your own strength. That's the result of your own wisdom. That's the result of your own prudence, as a result of your own pride. He says, you are laboring and you're heavy laden. And he says, and what I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you let rest from your own struggles. I'm going to give you rest. Yeah, the devil is still the devil. You still have an adversary out there. But the things that you're doing against yourself, what am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to call a truce so that you stop fighting against yourself. Because that's the biggest war. It's not the devil. It's you fighting against yourself. It, it is what you do to yourself. And, and then the devil participates with you in your process of self-destruction. He says, I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. I will bring you to the place of resting in me. You can rest in me. And he says, and here's what you do. He says, take my yoke upon you. Wait a minute now. I, I, I thought if I joined up with you that I would have to worry about a yoke. He said, no, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon me. So when he says, take my yoke upon you, he is saying there's still going to be some struggle. There's still going to be some striving. There's still going to be, in other words, if you look at in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 6, there's going to be a fight, the good fight of faith. You still have to fight against, a, you fight a battle. You got to fight, you're engaged in a battle. He says, but you take my yoke upon you. It is my yoke. You're no longer standing alone but take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. Now you yoke together with me. We become yoke fellows. So now what you're saying, now I'm going to show you the father while we're yoked together. Now watch what he's saying. I will make the father known to you as we experience life together. You see, you'll begin to see the father through experiencing life with me. But you'll never, you'll never be alone. I'm with you. In whatever you're enduring, whatever you have to go through, but I'm here to reveal the Father to you. You don't know the Father yet. To whom 
he will to reveal the Father of those that are yoked together with him. I'm going to make the Father known to you. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Learn from me. What am I teaching you? I'm teaching you the heart of Father. I'm teaching you the heart of the Father, he says. And as you learn from me, I, I, what am I doing? I'm revealing to you the heart of Father, he says. And then he said, for I'm gentle and, and, and lowly in heart. And he says, and what you do, the more we walk together, you will discover rest for your mind, your will, and your emotions. You're no longer struggling, striving. You're no longer at a place where you're upset and bitter. You're, 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 you're at a place where you're out of control, but you'll find rest for your souls. You'll speak peace to the storm that resides within. Where does war, where do wars come from? They come from within in your own members. You see, the things that you are striving for, you cannot attain the things that you, 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 you're wanting. You cannot get it, he said. And then uh, you don't get it because you don't ask for the right things. And when you ask, when you ask for things, you ask for myths. You ask for something that you may consume upon your own lust. He says, but I'll give you rest for your souls. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden, my burden, one burden is light. My burden is light. Now, as we look at this, we come to the place of understanding his lordship, his lordship. Uh, again, we still understand lordship. What, what happens? We confess him. This is what salvation is all about. We confess Jesus Christ as Lord. It is our acknowledgement, his lordship, and then it becomes our confession. You cannot confess him as Lord until you first acknowledge him as Lord. You see that? See, people think that it's merely a matter of saying something, but this word confession is to say with him what he is already saying. So the acknowledgement must precede the confession. You can say it once you've acknowledged it. His lordship, his sovereign rule over everything. He is in charge of all things. Now this word Lord, Lord, we begin to see uh, a name of God being Adonai. Adonai, A-D-O-N-A-I, Adonai. This word Adonai, it, it means the Lord. It, it is the Lord or Yahweh. Uh, the word Yahweh was, it had the, the, the vowels in there, but it was uh, Y-H-W-H. But it was a word that wasn't pronounced except by those uh, uh, priests at a particular time. He said, so it is really saying, and look at it now when it says Adonai, of the Lord. It is really saying the Lord God, the Lord God. It's important to understand what he's saying, the Lord God. It, it, it is a, it's doubly affirming God's sovereignty. It is doubly affirming his sovereignty. When you say Lord God, when you say his Lordship and then Yahweh God, but you say that Lord God, you, 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 you're, you're, that's double affirming his sovereignty. You're going deeper into understanding his sovereignty than you otherwise said. Some people say it without understanding this, but that's what you're really doing. You are, you are, uh, it is saying, I won't just say, it's almost like saying, I won't just call you God, but I'm calling you Lord God. Don't use that loosely because there are many that say, Lord, Lord, that will not enter into the kingdom because the life has to support that. He that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. So now, Lord God, that's his name, Lord God, Adonai. In fact, here in uh, Psalm 8 and 1, it says, O Lord, our Lord. Listen to these words. Aren't that, isn't that profound? O Lord, and then it personalizes it, our Lord. And, 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 and I could just stay there for a while. O Lord, it, it, it's like from the deep recesses of our heart. O Lord. And then you say, not only is my heart crying out, Lord, then I begin to look at the relationship, our Lord. How excellent is your name, where? In all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And then after the psalmist said that, he says, now the reason I say this is because you're the one who set your glory 
above the heavens. You set your glory above the heavens. In other words, you are glorified. Your perfect order is established above the order of the heavens. You see, when it talks about his glory, the estimation of his divine wisdom and might or strength and majesty is above the heavens. I, I, I like this word majesty because it talks about his greatness of appearance, his dignity, his grandeur, his splendor, all of that. We begin to see all of those qualities that, uh, it, it, that, that reside within him. He has set them above the heavens. And, and then it goes on in, in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8. He says, and the Lord describes himself and he speaks of himself. He says, I am the Lord. First of all, the psalmist said, oh, Lord, our, our Lord, uh, uh, which when he says our Lord, it is inclusive of others. He's inviting others to be a part. He's speaking on behalf of his people. But then it says in Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord. And he said, that is my name. I am the Lord. And that's my name. So when he says my name it, it, it is expressive of character. My name is Lord. My name is Lord. He is saying, that's my name. I, when, when he says about himself that I'm the Lord, I'm the sovereign, I'm the one in charge of all things, he is saying, you know, where he ain't, he's not bragging. We boast in him, but he can speak of himself, you see, and understand that's proper boasting. He says, I'm the Lord, that's my name. He says, and my glory, I will not give to another. Now, this word another, another means another of a different sort. I will not give my glory to another of a different sort. He says, only that which is a part of me, attached to me. That's why he says, come unto me. Come unto me. And when he says, follow me, work with me, walk with me, live your life. Let me live my life through you and in you. He says, and then you are partakers of my glory. He says, I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to carved images of another sort. I will not give my praise to carved images. And I'm, I'm giving her a close out because just a few more minutes. But here in Psalm 85 and verse 15, he says, so pursue them with your tempest. Now he talks about the greatness of God. He said, pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storms. This is the greatness and majesty of God. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. He said, in other words, he, shake them up, Lord. Shake them up. Let situations and circumstances uh, shake, shake them up and alarm them so that they may seek your name, O Lord. We mentioned his character, his attributes, that they may begin to go after you. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes. Let them be put to shame and perish that they, because, because what happens, that they may seek you, that they may seek you, because seek and ye shall find. He says that they may seek you, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth, that they may know, because the only way they're going to know it, something has to happen to shake them up. So he says, shake them up, Lord, that they may seek you. And when they seek you, they will find you. And then they're prostrate to see Christ as he is, that he may reveal to them that you are the Lord most high, higher than all the things that are elevated. You're higher than that over all the earth. So we see a sovereignty. I'm giving you several scriptures because I'm closing. But, but here in Isaiah 43 and 1, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob. You know, Jacob, trickster, whose, whose name was changed uh, to, to Israel. But, but Jacob and he who formed you, O Israel. Now we see he used both. He used the name prior to and, uh, and after he was formed. I created you as Jacob, but I formed you as Israel. He said, fear not, for I have redeemed you. We see the redemption in the name from the transition from Jacob to Israel. He said, I've called you by your name, your mind. See, this is so rich. I'm gonna to have to start 
closing down on some of this and finish it later on. But he says, I've called you by your name. What have I do? I call you by your form, your, your original name. I call you Jacob. He said, but I formed you now, O Israel. So now fear not, for I have redeemed you. And you have a new name. So now I've called you by your new name. I call you by your new name. Why? Because when, since I named you Israel, you're mine. When God gives us a name, he names us based upon the character that he's established within us. He's built this character within us. He says, so your new name is Israel. He says, but now don't forget Israel, you're mine. You're mine. Your name has been changed. Your character has been changed. But understand the reason that your character is changed. Don't ever take ownership of it independent of me, but you're my property. He says, now, Israel, Israel, when you pass through the waters, I will be with Israel. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel. What, why did he say Holy One of Jacob? He says, I'm the Holy One of Israel because I'm your Savior. So I saved you from Jacob so that you became Israel. He said, I gave Egypt for your ransom and Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. What is he saying here? He will steal, he would steal when there was occasion, make all the interests of the children of men give way to the interests of his own children. He says, I will give men for thee. This is what the uh, Bible translators say. It's a great man, mighty man, men of war and people, uh, men by wholesale for thy life. Nations shall be sacrificed to thy welfare. All shall be cut off rather than God's Israel shall. So precious are they in his sight. He says, I will sacrifice them for you because you are in fact mine. So we begin to see the, uh, I would say, his sovereignty. And then he brings us into relational connection in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. He says, now, now, and this is where I'm closing because I'm back to where we started on Sunday. He says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. We talk about divine, God's divine favor, God's divine blessing, God's divine favor and protection. He said, therefore, look at that. This reason for holy living, this reason for holy living or, or living a holy life. He says, come out from among them and be separate, be holy unto me, says the Lord. Do not touch the unclean for I will receive you and I will be, here's that, I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Almighty. So now we begin to see why the Lord says, be holy as I am holy. Why he wanted us not to be joined to any other, other than that which he would have us joined to. Because you see, God want to be your protector. He want to be your provider. He want to be all of those things to you. But if you're joined to another, if you're joined to another, they call that uh, 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 spiritual adultery. He said, I cannot give you what I do want to give you. you. Your life does not glorify me the way I would like for you to glorify me as long, unless you're holy unto the Lord. So now we talk about the relational collection, look at the sovereignty, and we look at the relational connection, God is saying, I want you to be rightly related to me. 
that which God has joined together. Let no one separate. Now, being rightly joined together in the church, being rightly joined together, being postured to make the right decisions in relation to how you are to be rejoined. What relationships are you to, first of all, establish and how are those relationships to be maintained? You see, God, Jesus Christ being Lord is the one who must determine that. He must determine that. And then what happens being joined to him and then being joined, rightly joined to one another, then the Father is glorified through that which the Lord has put together upon the earth. Because our lives must be a testimony and a witness of the goodness, the greatness, and the glory of our Lord. Father, thank you so much for what you're helping us to see and know and understand. We want to know the Father. We want to know you as our Father. And we know that we can only know you as our Father through knowing the Son, the Son, and coming into knowing him as our brother, brotherhood, being joined to him and allowing him to live his life in us, that the spirit of sonship will function and operate through our lives. So thank you for this word, and we pray that it will bring, make a difference, be the difference in the lives of those that heard it. Lord, may we be uh, fruitful servants so that we don't take what we're receiving merely unto ourselves, but the very work and mission of Christ. Let that work and mission become widespread through those of us who would be faithful to our call and our mission. So we give you the honor, praise, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Knowing Father through the Son, and, and, and that takes away all of that phony stuff where we think we know him and we think because we said a few magic words that we've entered into right relationship. But now we're talking about the kind of commitment and resolve that must take place within each heart in order to know the Father through the Son. The humility that's required, the brokenness, the, I would say, the divorcing ourselves from ourselves, the abandonment of all in order to be a follower of Christ. But that's what we invite you to. We're not just trying to get you to come to Cross Culture Church because we're trying to get some numbers here. No, we want to see, we want to see lives transformed because we realize it's going to be much easier to pastor you if your life has been changed than it would be to try to pastor you when you're, you're looking for something other than Christ. And you're expecting something from us other than what God would have us to give you. So if you are listening to the voice and you hear Christ speaking through me and you want to give your heart, your life, your all to him, by all means, this is the time to do it. I'll pray with you, but as I've been saying these last few weeks, it has to be a personal commitment to Christ. You have to pray with fervency and sincerity with your heart. Now, understand the poesy of his word. What God has spoken is potent enough to make a difference in your life. What God has spoken, you see, it's the invitation. You can stand on this. It's enough to stand on. It's enough to support the weight of your life. Whatever you might have been doing, whatever lifestyle you might have been engaged in, the word you've heard tonight is strong enough to support the weight of all of that. But you must step out in faith. You must trust him. You must take the word and add faith to it. Believe that what God has said, he's able to do. So let's pray. And, and after I pray, you pray and ask the Lord to come into your life. Father, I pray that your word will take root within the hearts of those that will sincerely hear and consider the things that you've spoken this night. And Lord, as they believe on you to 
trust you, Father, that you raised Jesus Christ. In fact, you delivered all things into his hands. So what they need is in his hands. And then not only does he have what is necessary, but he lived the example before all of us, and then he died for our sins. But Lord, I pray tonight that that would be those that would confess the fact that they were, uh, it was necessary for their lives. It was something that they needed to happen. That they will begin to see the sinfulness of sin and desire you to take charge of their lives completely. And when they come to that point, Lord, of confessing you as Lord, Jesus Christ as Lord, then they can take full advantage of the opportunity to provision you made through him. So Lord, I just pray that this will be the night where many will offer their lives to you and that Christ will be invited to live his life in them. And as they do it, Lord, we welcome them into the family. So we thank you. We give you the honor, praise, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So you pray now and ask the Lord to come into your life. Commit to the word that you've heard, even those things that you've come to understand, and ask God to give you a deeper and greater understanding of the things that you don't understand. And then let us know. If you made a commitment, resolve to the Lord. I'm talking to church folk too that might not have done what is required to be born again because being churchy is not enough. Going to church is inadequate. These times are threatening. Things are happening pretty fast. We're coming to the end, the last of the last days. And you gotta make, gotta make your calling and election sure. You don't wanna be under false pretenses. There are many that have taken the wide route, the wide path, and thinking because it's the most popular way that it's God's way, but narrow is the way. It's straight as the, uh, narrow is the path, straight is the way that leads to life. So if you are coming to the Lord, pray this prayer. You pray to him and ask him to come into your life and let us know that you've invited him in. And then I say to you that's praying, welcome to the family of God. Let us know and we won't, we're gonna get in touch with you. We wanna share some things with you and avail ourselves to walk with you so that you can live a life of victory. And if without a church home, we're here to minister to you. Don't get into this whole thing of megalomania that you think greatness is in largeness, but no, greatness could very well be in smallness. Uh, the best packages, the best gifts could come in small packages. So in this, God is saying, that he's offered you sincerity of heart and life. And if you're one that's hearing the message and God has been in your heart to be a part of this ministry, we invite you to come and be a part of where God is taking us. If you're walking in victory and you're being fed and you're growing in grace of God, by all means, praise God for you. You are brothers and sisters. And we uh, just look forward to fellowshipping with you and your church, your ministry and the like, so that iron can sharpen iron. But if you're not there, by all means, let's get there. Let's be a part of what God is saying, what God is doing. So you see the information on the screen so you can reach us and praise God for you. And We just believe that God is going to show you his way and lead you in his path. Amen. Now, last, we're going to honor God through giving. Praise God for those of you that believe in this ministry and you, uh, you, you, you've given your heart to the work of ministry, and you demonstrated it even through your giving. And I let me also say, while we're getting ready to give, that it's time for those that are healthy and and and, and uh, uh, beyond excuse to come back to church again, to come back to fellowshipping with the saints again. Don't 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 try to find an excuse. If there's a legitimate excuse, then by all means, uh, you exercise that and continue to be cautious. But if there's no other excuse whether other than convenience or for convenience sake, begin to check your foundation. Listen to the message I'm preaching. And it's time to come back to church. It's time to come back. It's time to, to fellowship again with the saints because it was never intended for church to be anything other than what God had 
ordained the church to be and what he established the church to become. So we want you to come back. We don't just want your money, we want you. So now let us give as God has prospered us. Faithful with your tithe, which is a measure, and beyond that, an offering unto the Lord. And as we pray, we pray that you're responsive to what God would, would prompt your hearts to do. Thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of your people. Thank you, Lord, that you called us to stewardship, but you've called us to a purpose. And may we fulfill that purpose. And we're saying we're giving all to you, our very lives to you. Therefore, the things you require of us, we don't see that as being difficult because of the fact that we're no longer our own. So thank you as you speak to hearts and as people are giving generously, liberally, liberally to your work, we give you the honor, the praise, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you. We look forward to Sunday morning. We believe God has a word for you on Sunday morning as we gather together. Uh, and those that cannot come we are still streaming, live streaming. And we have the parking lot for those that can't come in as of yet. But uh, by all means, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together in the matter some is. And all the more, as we see the day of the Lord approaching. So God bless you. And we praise God for you. May you continue to be yoked together with him so that you can discover that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Bless your people, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.